And that's when we backslide and get into trouble and miss heaven. So by God's grace, hopefully we'll all stay on this path and run the race and uh, defeat COVID. Um, so by way of introduction, we all know that uh, COVID-19 is a viral infection, viral disease that affects multiple systems and is caused by the virus named severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. So for short, we'll call it SARS-CoV-2. So again, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19. So COVID-19 is the disease that's caused by SARS-CoV-2. As of today, over 35 million people have been infected worldwide, confirmed cases. I'm not talking about the ones that are not confirmed. Then if we bring it home to the United States, at least 8.5 million people have been infected, confirmed cases. Unfortunately, we have lost over 220,000 people. Let that sink in. That is a lot of people we have lost so far. And um, this disease affects everybody. So initially in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a, uh, we thought, oh, maybe it's just the elderly. No, it's everybody from age zero to over a hundred. We're all at risk for this disease. How is it spread? How do we catch it? Now, there are many ways, but I'll hit on the main mode. So the main mode of transmission, the main way where you can get it is from person to person close contact through droplets, respiratory droplets. So droplets are what leaves our mouth when we talk, when we cough, when we sneeze. We all let out droplets. And these droplets travel about six feet and then drop to the floor, okay? And that's why that thought process of you should stay six feet away from six feet away from people. Now we also know that it can spread through aerosols, so the airborne mode. So this is where it travels even faster. So they are tinier particles, and they travel even further away from where it's released. The, there are situations where this is more likely to happen. Such situations are like let's say you're in a poorly ventilated room, closed space, and someone is singing or talking loudly or shouting. In that scenario, they let out a lot of particles and some of those particles become aerosolized to where they can travel further distances so that even if you're more than six feet away from the person who released the aerosol, you are still at risk. So that's why we're discouraging, congregating in in indoors, in the poorly ventilated room and with people singing, shouting or talking loudly. That's really high risk. The other main way is if your hands get contaminated from touching an environment that's already contaminated. So now typically it has to be heavily contaminated environment. Now you, your hands, so like maybe the table in the house of somebody who has COVID or the doorknob that has just been touched by somebody who has sneezed into their hand and had COVID and pasted it on the doorknob. So if you touch that and touch your eyes or your nose or your mouth, you can get infected. Now, not all exposures are equal. So in other words, it de depending on the scenario where you're exposed, you may or may not catch the illness. So I'll tell you the scenario where you're most likely to catch it. So if you're in close contact with someone who has it for a long period of time, then you're most likely to catch it. So this example, if I have COVID, then my husband is at a very high risk of catching COVID because he's in close contact with me and we're, we're together in the same house for a long duration. Now, if I went to church, in an indoor setting where maybe the church doesn't have good ventilation and I'm singing or I'm shouting or I'm talking loudly without a mask on, my contacts there at risk as well. And the longer you stay in that situation, so the more hours you spend there or minutes you spend there, the higher the risk. And there's actually an accumulated risk where if you keep exposing yourself to that person who has the COVID, over a period of time that increases your risk. So it accumulates, okay? 
So again, remember the highest risk is being in prolonged contact with indoor setting with someone who has it. So household contact, maybe if you're in a nursing home, maybe a, 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 a cruise ship, maybe a bar, uh, maybe a party, things that we really shouldn't be doing at this time. So you should really avoid congregating indoors with a lot of people. That increases your risk. Now, when one is infected, they are usually most contagious within the first six days, seven days of it. Meaning if I have COVID, I will start to transmit it even before I get symptoms and up to maybe about seven days into my illness, I'll be highly contagious. After day seven, my ability to spread it decreases. So which is why that, that the new the, uh, recommendation where you say, when someone has had it for 10 days and they no longer have symptoms, they are no longer considered contagious. That's because after day seven, your ability to transmit starts to drop. Now, remember, whether you have symptoms or you don't have symptoms, you can still transmit the virus. So asymptomatic people, people without symptoms can still pass it on. And the people who are what we call pre-symptomatic, so they're eventually gonna have symptoms, but before they develop the symptoms, they can still pass the virus. It is important to know this, and that's why we, we're encouraging masking, because if you think, okay, I will look at, see the person who's coughing or sneezing, I'll keep away from that person. I may have absolutely no symptoms and I have COVID. And because I feel good, I'm, I'm able to spread it. Another thing to note is reinfections can occur. So in the beginning, we were not sure whether if one, when one has COVID, uh, once they, they recover from it, maybe they won't get infected again. Now we know that, yes, one can get reinfected with COVID. So reinfections can occur. Why this is important is, if one has suffered from COVID and recovered, don't feel okay, now you have a blank check. I'm just gonna go around without my mask. I'm safe, I'm immune. Don't feel that way. You can get reinfected, okay? Now, once one gets infected, there's an incubation period. So incubation period is a period between when one is exposed to an infection and when they start to exhibit it or when this infection is established. So typically when one is exposed within 14 days of exposure, if they're going to get infected, they will be infected within 14 days. It will usually manifest maybe day five, day four, five after you've been exposed. Remember again, some people will never have symptoms. They will get infected, they will have the whole illness and not have a symptom. So they will not be aware that they've been infected. Now, for those that have symptoms, what symptoms do they exhibit? So there's a myriad of it, but I'll just run through the common ones. So fevers, chills, cough, just getting tired, fatigue out of the ordinary, headaches, difficulty breathing, sore throat. Some people lose their sense of smell. Some people lose their taste. Some people vomit. Some people have diarrhea. Some people have painful spots in their fingers and toes. So there's so many different things that can that can that, that this COVID can present as. Uh, it's really the uh, great masquerade. Like it's 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 something else. It's, the diff it's just a, an amazing virus. Now, not everybody who gets infected gets very sick, okay? So there's this group of people, people with comorbidities who when they get infected, they are at a higher risk to get very sick. So for the most part, at least 80% of patients that end up with COVID do well, at least 80%. Now there's a 20% who will not do well in the sense that they'll get very sick to where they'll end up in the hospital. Now we know some comorbidities, some things that will predispose one to fall into that risk of getting very sick with COVID. So I'm going to just tell you guys some of those, some of those risks. Number one, age. The older you are, so if you're 50 and over, you are at a higher risk for severe COVID. If you have diabetes, if you're obese, so if you're overweight, if you have high blood pressure, if you have asthma or difficulty, some respiratory issues, if you have cancer, if your immune, immune system is impaired in any way, and then also depends on your race. 
we have found that people of color, Blacks and Hispanics at, an at a higher risk for severe disease compared to Caucasians. And I'll just uh, share with you a, um, just a, a graph that shows the mortality by age. Just I'm going to share my screen briefly. So if you see the graph, just don't, don't worry about the numbers on the um, uh, uh, axis. Just pay attention to how, as the age increases, the risk for mortality or severe disease from COVID uh, increases, just so you get the picture. OK. Sorry, one second, let me. Yeah, thank you. So yes, so, so that just illustrates to you why the recommendation is that the older you are, please pay attention to the, all these preventive measures that are being prescribed so that you'll avoid ending into that trouble. Now, so for that 20% of the population that get into trouble and end up in the hospital, there are many complications that occur. The biggest of them is having a pneumonia and the lungs failing. The lungs fail to where they now require oxygen to breathe. Some go from just requiring oxygen that's put through the nose to requiring the one that's put through the mask to ending up on the ventilator to ending up on a, what we call ECMO, where a machine takes over the job of your lungs and your heart. That, that, that's the extreme. And as you can imagine, the further down you go this spectrum, the higher the risk for death, okay? One, they can have a heart attack, you can have a stroke, you can have blood clots to your lungs. This, this virus is so vicious. I mean, it, it, it makes your, it, it causes what we call a hypercoagulable state where you run a risk of forming clots for no good reason. And when you, one forms clots like that, it can cause any of these things I told you. So blood clots in the lungs, in the heart, in different organs, in the kidneys to where the kidneys fail and one ends up on dialysis. Um, you can have other infections. Then you can have a situation we call the cytokine storm where your body in a bid to fight the virus marshals out all these inflammatory agents that are supposed to fight the virus, but because they are overwhelming, they overwhelm the body and fight the body as well and actually causes more harm than the good they're supposed to do. And those patients end up really sick. Many of them, well, quite a few of them uh, end up not making it. The good news is as we have been dealing with this uh, we, we have learned quite a lot. It's been a very steep learning curve. And uh, I must say now we're more comfortable come with dealing with these patients and uh, we're able to save more. Uh, so which is very good news. Now, after one has had the COVID, again, the majority of the people will do well to where, to where they, they, they get better and it's done. Now, but there are some people who we, we found that they call the long haulers, the COVID long haulers. These people, long after they've recovered, they continue to experience symptoms. Some of them have joint pain. Some of them have difficulty breathing. Some of them have fatigue to where they cannot function for months and months and months after they've had this uh, illness. Uh, another group will complain of brain fog where they lose their memory. Some outright lose their memory and can't remember anything. Some will have their memory, but have episodes of confusion. Some will have dizziness. Some can't sleep. Some, it's almost like a post-traumatic stress syndrome. And we think it's as a result of the ongoing inflammatory uh, response that the body has. And it, it can be debilitating. A lot of people have kind of resigned their jobs because they just cannot function. So it's really serious. Um, again, the vast majority will do well to where they get better, but in a certain percentage, these complications can occur. So how do we treat? Treatment at this time, if the patient is doing well and at home, it's really supportive care where you don't give any active medication. So if they have fevers, you give Tylenol, um, then they have to continue monitoring their oxygen level to make sure they're not getting into trouble to where they have to come to the hospital. Now, if the patient is sick enough to come to the hospital, there are some medications that we, we can uh, give. Let me first of all start by saying hydroxychloroquine does not work. Okay, It does not work for treatment. It does not work for prevention. That's been proven beyond any doubt. So we do not use hydroxychloroquine. Fortunately, we have things we use. Uh, 
about two days ago or so, FDA approved one of the trial medications, Remdesivir, is an antiviral medication that we now use. The way it works is it shortens the length of time one is sick with COVID. So it can shorten the duration for about maybe five days. Um, then there's the monoclonal antibodies, which was in the news lately because our president uh, got it. Uh, two companies are making it, it's still in trial. Um, one is being made by Regeneron, the other is being made by Eli Lilly. And the, the, it is antibodies that directly fight the virus. So the idea is if you can clear the virus faster, then you can decrease the damage that it does and the person can get better faster. Now it's not approved, it's still in the experimental stage, but it's being given. There's convalescent plasma that also given, it works the same way as the monoclonal antibody works. Then the one that's been proven to decrease mortality, steroids, so dexamethasone. So we do use that, um, especially in patients who are on oxygen, um, it's been shown to be a, a lifesaver, really. Um, now, have, having said all this, the, uh, there's an age-old saying, prevention is better than cure. Prevention of COVID is better than trying to treat it. We don't have a cure, but we have to prevent. It's really, really important. Now, you might say, oh, I've seen many people who have had COVID, and they did well, nothing happened to them. People are fear mongering, we're just trying to scare people. No, there's a saying in my language, I'm gonna say it in my language and I'll, I'll translate it. I'm an Igbo girl so, and I'm very proud of my heritage. So it goes, okay, so long were a mammy, or come were a gakoke. So in English, <laughs> loosely it is, if a rat jumps into water with a lizard, now remember the rat has hair, it's furry. If so, if a rat and a lizard jump into the water, when they come out of the water, when the lizard dries out, will the rat dry out? In other words, if you think Mr. A or Ms. B got COVID and they did very well and nothing happened, so if I get COVID, I'll be fine. No, you don't know that. There's a randomness to this illness, which is scary. So a family of four can have COVID, or a family of six, let's use six, two, will have no symptoms. Two will have symptoms or will be okay. And two will die. So remember, it's a family. They still, they have the same genetics, but somehow two got so sick to, to die. Two had nothing. So, so we really to strive not to get it. You don't want to get it because you don't know if you will be that rat who will not dry out when the lizard dries out, okay? Now, so prevention, how do we prevent? What do we have? Um, number one, masks. I'm gonna share, uh, let me share my screen again. So a picture of how masks work. Now, as Christians, um, we're commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. Bible tells us that that's the greatest commandment. So I want us Christians to view the mask as the act of love, okay? So in this schematic, you would see, just look at the way that picture, I got it from, by the way, from Memorial Hermann Hospital. So if you look at the first picture, where you see the COVID carrier does not have a mask and the person that she exposes does not have a mask. So in that scenario, this person here is at a very high risk of ending up with COVID. In the second picture, you can see the carrier does not have a mask, but the person who she exposes has a mask there's still a high risk of illness. It's not very high like number one, but it's still there. Third picture, the carrier has a mask, but the person they exposed does not have a mask. It's a lower risk of illness, but it's not zero. So the best scenario is where the carrier has a mask on and the person they exposed has a mask on. So that's where you have the least risk of illness. So masks work when we all wear the masks. When everybody wears them, the masks work. Um, so let, me, let me get out of the screen again, sorry, one second. Thank you. Yeah, so, so please, 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 we should preach, we should use this as a, a reach out to our people this is an act of love. We all have to wear the mask. Whether you've had the COVID and recovered and you feel that you're safe or not, 
wear a mask. Remember, you can be reinfected. Now, there's something else I want to say about wearing the mask. It's not enough to wear the mask. You have to wear it right. It needs to cover your nose and your mouth. I see people put it here. So I'm putting it here and expose their nose. Then there's something else I've seen people do lately, which I need to point out that it's, it doesn't make sense. I see people wear a face shield and no mask. That doesn't make sense, okay? There's nothing wrong with using a face shield, but you need a mask on. The face shield does not take the place of the mask. So put your mask on, then put the face shield, okay? The other thing we need to do is social distancing, so physical distancing. This is very important. Like I told you in the beginning, or towards the beginning of the presentation, remember if you're in a closed space, poorly ventilated area where you cannot maintain a distance of at least six feet. So six feet is the minimum. Be as far away as possible, but the minimum is six feet. So if you're in that area where you cannot maintain a, a distance of six feet, you're in trouble. And it's not enough to be outside. So don't think, okay, I'm outside. So I don't have to socially distance. We have a recent good example for the whole country. Something that happened recently in the White House where you had the super spreader event. Remember, they were all outside, but they were not distant. And many of them did not have masks on. And look at the number of infections that occurred. So that should tell you that it's important to maintain that distance of six feet minimum from the next person in order to decrease your risk. Wear a mask, social, physically distant, and of course, wash your hands. Uh, we've talked about hand washing in our church and maybe you guys have seen me talk on hand washing, but the important thing is wash your hands with either soap and water or the alcohol gel or alcohol rub. With soap and water, you wanna wash your hands for 20 seconds. You can say the Lord's Prayer while you're doing it, that last 20 seconds. And while you're doing it, you really have to rub. You have to walk it in between two. Don't just do this and do this and think you're done. That's not hand washing. Now, if you're gonna use the, hand, the alcohol gel, you need to keep rubbing it in until it's dry. Don't put it on and, and do this and do this and think you're done. You have to rub it in until it's done. That will be the appropriate hand washing. Then also, you want to clean surfaces that are touched regularly or contaminated. Now, you don't have to quarantine your meal. That is totally unnecessary. And you don't have to sterilize your grocery. That's unnecessary too, okay? Um, then vaccines. We don't have vaccines yet, but they are coming. They're going to come. Um, it's highly unlikely that any, or, any of us will get a COVID vaccine in this 2020, but come 2021, uh, for sure, the vaccines will come. I'm thinking, based on what I see and what I hear, maybe spring, late spring, it should be available for everybody. I'm not talking about the first set of people. So early in, early in uh, 20, 2021, it should be available maybe the first responders or something, but I don't think all of us on this call will have access to a vaccine until maybe late spring or so, okay? But when it works, when it comes, hopefully it will work. And if it works, then we can finally achieve this herd immunity that everybody is hoping uh, to achieve. Now, what, let's talk about the collateral damage of this pandemic. So because the pandemic is here, doesn't mean all that diseases disappeared. So many patients, many people stopped seeking medical help because of COVID. They were scared to come to the hospitals or scared to come to the doctors. As a result, patients were dying at home from stroke, from heart attack. Some were dying of really bad infections. Their cancers were progressing. So please, 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 please do not ignore your preventive medicine because of COVID. Still go see your doctors, go do your annual physicals. Colonoscopy, screening colonoscopy is very important. If you're 40 years and over, you need a screening colonoscopy. If you belong to the Cathedral uh, Church in Houston, we actually have a gastroenterologist, uh, Dr. Ofo Ewalokwa, very good, he's excellent. If you're in the Houston area, reach out to him, he can do your colonoscopy. And women, don't forget your mammogram, don't forget your pap smear, do not neglect yourselves. Now, the other big, big collateral damage of this pandemic is created a lot of stress. The stress of being indoors, the stress of quarantining. So people lost their jobs. So people got sick. So people lost family members. And this has led to mental illnesses. So like uh, the Reverend uh, 
uh, Calvin Miles said in the beginning of this, but before I started to talk, people are turning into alcohol, drug abuse, drug overdose, suicide, and of course, stress on the family leading to divorce, lots of depression. So in this latter half, the second half of this presentation, Dr. Michael Watkins and Dr. Izumachuku will dwell on this, on this mental illnesses that have arisen as a result of this pandemic. Um, let me uh, end by saying a couple of, again, it's gonna be something in Igbo. Um, in Igbo we say, Osondo Aguike, which means when you're running for your life, you cannot get tired. I know we've been saying the same thing over and over. We, meaning the infectious disease uh, community, the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare givers. We've been saying, oh, wash your hands, wear a mask, socially distant. And it can be tiring, but you cannot, we cannot afford to get tired. Again, we Christians are not called for easy jobs. We're called for some things that are difficult. I'm gonna teach you a new song. Um, I don't have a, a good voice, so you're go I'm gonna crave your indulgence. Um, there's a song that goes this way, which most of the people on this line know. It goes, heavenly race, I know go tire, heavenly race. I know go tire, heavenly race. I know go tire, I know go tire. I know go tire is pidgin English. It stands for, I won't get tired. So now the new song is, instead of saying heavenly race, I want you to say pandemic race. I no go tire, pandemic race. I no go tire, pandemic race. I no go tire, I no go tire. So when you think you're getting tired of COVID-19 or getting tired of wearing masks or socially distancing or, 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 or washing your hands, you can sing this song to yourself. Remember me and then sing the song to yourself and get your energy back and let's keep fighting. We will get over this. We'll, it will go away eventually one day, but we have to do the right things until the vaccines come. And of course, God will help us. Thank you so much for your time. I will take questions at the end of the session. When, when all the, uh, the two presenters are done, then we'll take questions. Thank you again. Okay. Um, oh, I guess I'm- Continue, you're, you're still in charge. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> okay, so the next the next presenter will be um, Dr. Michael Watkins, who will uh, speak to us about uh, the family units, both well-functioning family units and dysfunctioning family units. And after him, it will be uh, Dr. Izumachuku, uh, Dr. Michael Watkins. Thank you, Dr. Obi, and hello. It's very nice to meet you. First of all, let me uh, express my thanks to His Grace Bishop Orji for inviting me to address the Senate. It is indeed an honor. I thank you very much for the opportunity. To Dr. Izo, having, having worked with you on a prior project, it's nice to work with you again. As I began the research for this presentation, I asked myself, maybe we should start with a definition. So the first thing that I asked is, what is a family? And I started looking at different definitions. I looked in the dictionary and looked at some resources online and looked at some of my personal library and a cursory examination of this definition yields several different approaches. First, a family is a group of people who share common ancestors. And while this may be true, it seems to leave an awful lot out. The next definition I came across a family is a specific group of people that may be made up of partners, children, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents. But again, this definition seemed to me to be very lacking. The last one I'm going to mention is the definition that came from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. A family is the basic unit in society traditionally consisting of two parents, rearing their children. Also, any of various social units differing from, but regarded as equivalent to the traditional family. And again, this definition seemed to me to be very lacking because it misses completely the role of the family in society. 
Let me talk a, very briefly about the socialization process, because I think we all recognize that the family is the basic unit for imparting social values, our beliefs about behavioral expectations, and our religious beliefs. So let's talk about socialization. We begin socializing children, so I'm sorry, socializing children at birth. When a child is born, let's say it's a little girl, what color blanket is that girl wrapped in? What's the receiving blanket color? Well, usually it's either pink or yellow. If you have a, a baby boy, it's generally wrapped in a blue receiving blanket. So we're noticing differences between children already the moment they're born. As children begin to grow, we dress them in different clothes. So little girls wear skirts and dresses. Little boys wear blue jeans, boots, sneakers. Let's take the situation of two small children. Let's say they're both four years old because we treat children differently also. And think about this. You have two little four-year-olds, one little boy, one little girl. They both go running down the sidewalk, they're playing, and they both fall and scrape their knee. And both of them start to cry. How do we treat the little boy? In general, what we do with the little boy is we pick him up, dust him off, and make some comment to, be, to him like, take it like a man. The little girl, we pick her up, we pat her on the back, and, oh, please don't cry. It'll be okay. You'll be all right. I'd like to challenge anyone to find me a four-year-old little boy that knows anything about being a man. Just, just a comment. So around 1966, Dr. Murray Bowen developed a system of viewing the family, and it's called family systems theory. It's a theory developed by Dr. Bowen, and the theory postulates that individuals cannot be understood in isolation. And the reason for this is very simple. People are part of a family. And so I think it's inherent on all of us to expand our own definition of what it is that we mean by a family, because there's a, a great deal of interconnectedness and inter interdependence in family systems. And this is what Dr. Bowen was directly addressing. So the overarching goal of family systems theory in a treatment setting or in therapy is to help the individual heal with the assistance of the family, since generally it is the family's impact that aids healing the most. And one thing I will repeat several different times during my presentation is if you have something wrong with one member of the family, it impacts on everyone in the family, not just the person suffering from the problem. And this is important. So again, the individual is understood as part of a family system and in treatment environments, other members of the family must be considered. I think one of the things that Dr. Bowen postulated is that the person with the problem isn't necessarily the person that must be seen in treatment. As I said, what impacts on one member of the family impacts on every member of the family. It's the other members of the family who change their behavior to adapt to the family member that's experiencing a problem. And so one of the issues in treatment could become dealing with the non-problematic family members in order to have them adjust their behavior again to bring the family member with the problem back into an appropriate mode of thinking or speaking or feeling. The interconnection and interdependence among family members is deeply rooted and it also differs by the individual. No two situations are ever the same. No two families are the same. The dynamics of each family are different. And where we may share some commonalities, again, the families are different. In spite of the fact that interdependence varies for each person, families have a profound impact which affects the behavior of the individual. And that's the goal in any type of treatment environment 
when we have a dysfunction in the family unit. In terms of overall development, this means that a child raised in a loving, caring home will more than likely do better than a child raised in an abusive or dysfunctional home environment. I've, my private practice centers on forensic psychology. I've been in private practice now for a little bit over 21 years. After a 23 and a half year career in law enforcement in the criminal justice system. And I have seen firsthand the impact on children of being raised in dysfunctional family units through the juvenile justice system. One of my first forensic jobs when I finished 15 years of schooling was to work as a treatment director in a prison for adolescents. It was an interesting and very rewarding experience for me, but it was also an eye opener because I was exposed to a lot of different issues that I would never have even thought of had I not been in that environment. And so Dr. Bowen talks about this interconnectedness in families by outlining eight basic concepts. And these concepts are triangles, which deal with relationships, the differentiation of self, which is individual development, the nuclear family emotional process, how emotions guide and are connected to the nuclear family and some problem areas that can arise, the family projection process, which is almost always problematic, the multi-generational transmission process, which outlines how interconnectedness can change and the differentiation of self can change as we marry. And you introduce in family different, different family units. And they are in fact different. He talks involves on a level of tension. Sibling position is another area that Dr. Bowen talked about, and this is an extension of, uh, I believe it's Walter Toman's theory. So <clears throat> Dr. Bowen kind of adapted this into family systems theory. And finally, he talks about the societal emotional process. Given the time restraints that we have, I'm not gonna spend an awful lot of time talking about each one of these, but I am gonna touch on each one at least briefly. In terms of relationships, all relationships, according to Dr. Bowen, seek stability or balance. A linear relationship simply between two people is generally not enough to create that level of balance that's required to maintain the relationship. And so Dr. Bowen talked about triangles, which are more stable. They're more stable simply because the addition of a third party into a relationship, any type of relationship, be it a friendship relationship or a familial relationship, has a tendency to allow for the dissipation of tension or anxiety in that unit. Therefore, it allows for toleration of more tension, which a two-person system does not allow for. Think about this. When you were growing up, can you think of a time when you were happy, say because your father got a promotion at work? Let's say you were five or six years old. Did you understand the dynamics, what it meant for the family, for your father to get that promotion? Probably not, but you know that you were happy. Whether you understood that or not, the relationships in the family at that particular moment were positive based on what was going on, okay? And again, keep this always in the back of your mind. Families are subject not only to internal pressures, but to external pressures and cultural pressures. So those things are also important. Let's talk about the differentiation of self, the second degree of interconnectedness that Dr. Bowen addressed. Family members are unique and each develops their own personalities based on their own perceptions. Different people can interpret different incidents in different ways. One of the things that we used to say in law enforcement is you can have an incident occur even have a hundred people witness that incident and you'll get a hundred different versions of what happened. And in my experience in law enforcement, by and large, that was fairly true. The same is true of the family unit. Based on the level of interconnectedness 
and the appropriate differentiation of self. A person with a strong sense of self would probably not be overly influenced by a group in any conflict situation where the concept became, came into conflict with that of a group. That individual would exhibit a high self-confidence and be able to maintain his or her own belief system in spite of the opposition. In general, they would remain calm and level-headed in the face of conflict or different opinions. This feeds into some of the other areas that Dr. Bowen addressed. A person with a less well-developed sense of self might well have much more regard for the opinion of the group and try to please others. And please remember this when we get to <clears throat> the section where we're talking about sibling position, because that's fairly important. The more interdependence that exists in a family unit leads to a less well-developed sense of self in family members. This also leads to a situation in which the issues of one family member has a dramatic impact on every member of the family. And it doesn't take too much imagination to be able to figure out why. Let's talk about the nuclear family emotional process. And this is an area where the family can truly experience some major problems and develop some very serious issues, which may in fact rise to clinical attention. The four relationship patterns are identified by Dr. Bowen. He says clinical problems usually develop in times of heightened or prolonged stress or tension. The tension level depends on the family stress and the family's adaptive abilities in dealing with stress and on the family's connection to extended family and social networks, such as our church. The four relationship patterns are as follows. The first is marital conflict. Consider a conflict outside the family that leads to partners venting their frustrations on each other. And if we think that children aren't aware that there is tension that exists between their parents, please rethink that. They certainly are. They are very well aware and they react to it. They are, react to it in a lot of different ways. One of those is the development of depression when they see that there is a fracturing in the relationship between their parents. Again, please remember that relationships seek balance. Marital conflict leads to a situation where the relationship is no longer in balance. It can be put back in balance, but for the moment, it's out of balance. Let's talk about dysfunction of one spouse. Let's say that a family member, based on Dr. Obi's presentation, has developed COVID and now must be isolated and can't be around the family. What has happened now to the balance in that family? What has happened to the parents? You have a parent who is now in a situation where it's abnormal, it's dysfunctional. And so everyone else in the family now must react to that family member having the COVID. Now we've introduced an element of fear. And a lot of that has to do with outside media influence and the fact that as Dr. Obi pointed out, we have over 8 million positive cases in this country and 223,000 people have died as a result of COVID. Things like this are important. They have a major impact on the family members. Depending on the level of tension, a clinical issue may certainly arise. And usually we're gonna see that with the children. The next area that Dr. Bowen talks about in relationship patterns is impairment of one or more children. If you have a, a child who is ill, has a serious illness, then spouses tend to focus their anxieties on that child, leading the child to focus more on the parent. What happens in this case is the child becomes more sensitive to the the attitudes, needs, and expectations of the parent, thereby undermining the ability of the child to differentiate from the family, to develop their own personality, leading to perhaps acting out behaviors 
and possibly the development of clinical issues as well as possibly medical issues. This again is, let's consider a case where one of the children develops COVID-19. Everyone now is reacting to the child. Hopefully, I think some most of the research says that most children will probably handle the infection of COVID-19 fairly well, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. There have been children who have succumbed to this disease and we need to be prepared for issues such as that. And again, what about the remainder of the family when we're dealing with a child who is in fact impaired? Finally, emotional distance. People tend to distance themselves from each other in order to reduce tension in a relationship. As a result, communication breaks down. If communication breaks down, you no longer have stability or balance in the family relationship. And so this again could raise or rise to clinical levels and require some type of intervention. The family projection process describes how parents may have emotional or social stresses, which they transmit to their children in some way. The process follows three steps. The parent fears that the child has some issue, begins to pay extra attention to to be. The child then in response begins to behave in such a way as to confirm or reinforce the parent's fear. The child then is treated as if there actually is an issue with the child. Let's say the child went to school, had a conflict with another child and acted out in school. Now we have the school involved, they contact the parent. And so the child begins to be treated as if there's some type of behavioral issue with the child. So as the parent increases their attention to that child, it almost becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the child may in fact develop some type of a disorder. He's certainly treated as if there is. This then leads to a situation in which the child becomes dependent on the parent, interrupting the appropriate development of a sense of self. Again, so we feed back into transmission of values and socialization. Let's talk about the multi-generational transmission process very briefly. This process ad addresses the relationship of parents with their children in one generation and the introduction of others into the family through marriage. The possibility that a spouse may have a different sense of self than the family member marrying leads to a situation in which the children are now subject to two differing senses of self, hence some level of conflict, requiring enhanced communication so that we create and maintain that balance so critical for the maintenance of, relation, of relationships. The attitudes and behaviors of parents toward the previous generation may become the norm for the newer generations. Let's talk about a negative sense. If the parents in one generation have a negative view of the previous generation and they voice those conflict areas, what is the new generation of children going to think? And what are they going to think is the norm when dealing with their parents? They're probably going to think the norm is to treat their parents the way their parents treated their grandparents. This can be detrimental. I've seen that happen. It's been it's very, very interesting. Also very detrimental. Very briefly, I want to talk about the sibling position. The birth order of siblings plays a major role in the development of self. Older siblings tend to get most of the achievement pressure from their parents. I have a, had a, a sister, she passed away last year, who was just, she was 17 months older than me, and I was the oldest boy. I was raised in an Irish Catholic family. And if you know anything about Irish Catholic families, you know that there's a great deal of achievement pressure on the oldest boy. Well, guess what I was? So I've experienced this 
firsthand. Here's another thing. When children are born, okay, I've, I've always thought that this was really, really interesting because much of the achievement pressure placed on children has to do with parenting styles. I've always been struck by this fact. To do what I do, I'm required to have a license. To do what Dr. Obi does, she's required to have a license. To do what Dr. Izu does, she's required to have a license. To drive a car, I'm required to have a license. But perhaps the most important role that any of us could ever play is that of a parent. Somebody please tell me why I get a license to do that. There isn't one. There are no classroom rooms that you can attend that say, this is appropriate parroting and this is not. There's no degree that you can get that says, well, I have a degree in parenting. It doesn't work that way. So how do we learn how to parent? We learn how to parent essentially by imitating what our parents did or asking questions. And sometimes we're too proud as adults to ask questions. Kind of silly, but it's also a fact. Older siblings tend to be more achievement oriented and be leaders while younger siblings tend to be followers. And this is kind of interesting. I mentioned the achievement pressure on older children. Think about this. Parents learn to parent by watching their parents or by asking questions or by trial and error. Well, this works, but this doesn't. And you're right. This doesn't work, but this will. Okay. But think about this. With the first child, you're going through that trial and error process and you have a tendency to be pretty strict, pretty hard on that oldest child. When the second child comes along, we have a tendency to relax a little bit. So the expectations that we had for the older child, we no longer had for the second child. Let's say that we had a third child. So now we have a middle child, okay? So you have the oldest child who has had all of the achievement pressure. You have the second child who is now the middle child who didn't have all of those restrictions. And now you have a third child. How do the parents treat the third child? In general, Parents have a tendency to really relax. Well, we've been through this quite twice before. We're all pros at this. What happens to the relationship in the family in between the siblings? Is there a balance? I think not because the expectations are different. But remember, we talked about the differentiation of self and each person differentiates differently. Each person's personality develops differently based on the dynamics that we're dealing with within the family unit. Finally, the societal emotional process and family systems theory does not limit the development of the self to only families. And it's impossible to do that. It is recognized that societal and cultural differences also have an impact and can influence families for generations. Think about this. I think it was Hillary Clinton a few years ago that wrote a book called It Takes a Village. I remember reading that book. I wasn't really impressed with it, but I was still in the police department at that time, so didn't, didn't think much about it. So, but I remember very distinctly paying attention to the fact that it wasn't just my wife and I that had an impact on our children. They went to school. Lo and behold, they have teachers. Teachers are an instrument of imparting social values onto children. Oh my goodness. What a blinding revelation. How about grandparents? I'm now a grandparent. And I use every opportunity available to me to impart knowledge to my grandchildren. That was true also in my family. And I thank God that it was. In times of social unrest, such as what we're experiencing right now, parents have, have a tendency to monitor their children. And in these times, we have a habit of giving in to our children's demands 
rather than maintaining the standards which we think are appropriate. What happens to the relationship now? Again, it's out of balance. Parents with a greater sense of self are able to establish and enforce limits while parents with a lesser sense of self have difficulty. In closing, let me say very simply, the family systems theory as developed and presented by Dr. Bowen examines the influence of the family unit on the development of the individual and possible resultant behaviors. While it presents answers to many questions, it also has its shortcomings and is not intended in any way to be a panacea for all problems experienced by individuals of a clinical nature. One of the issues that I have with family systems theory is that it has a tendency to treat all variables as of equal value, and they're not. There are certain things in any family system or in any family unit that are of more importance than others. Sometimes we get a little confused and we emphasize things that perhaps we should de-emphasize. Rather than present the belief that the family unit is not of importance, Dr. Bowen presents the belief that the family unit is of paramount importance, both in individual development and in the resolution of most clinical issues presented. Thank you very much for your time. And again, Dr. Obi, thank you for the organization, Bishop Borgi, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, oh, Dr. You. Michael Watkins. Thank you. I really appreciate. So next we'll have Dr. Izu Wachuku, um, who will speak on depression in the Christian family. Thank you. Dr. Wachuku. Or mute yourself. Okay, done. Are you on? <laughs> yeah, no. Thank you. And um before I proceed, I would like to say a very big thanks to the two earlier speakers, Dr. B. Joffo, for how you're always able to present complete, comprehensive medical information, breaking it down to a level where it is easily understandable and appreciated by every non-medical mind. Thank you. And Dr. Watkins, I, again, it's uh, always great to, to work with you. I'm a big fan of the family system psychology. Um, in my clinical practice, I always say there has to be a very good reason for me to see a patient five times without having seen or met with somebody in the family because I really do appreciate the fact of how we interdepend on each other. As a psychiatrist, I also teach my students and residents that the most important investigation we do is collateral history and speaking with somebody typically from the family, but could also be a friend, a work colleague, or even a neighbor. So thank you very much. My topic today is depression in the Christian family, finding Christ in the darkness of depression. Before I proceed with that, I want to also extend my acknowledgements to our Lord Bishop. Um, I don't know how you do it, um, I, I just want all of us to pay attention to, to this. I, I've been to a couple of synods and I've been to different churches in my life. And I, I always appreciate how Bishop Oji looks after us holistically, H-O-L-I-C, you know, holistically in a wholesome way. It's the, the, the body, it's the mind, it's the soul. And if you think about what we've gone through in this synod, it's, it's the soul you know, the, the liturgy, the, the Bible, it's the physical body. Right now, the hot topic is COVID-19. And we've learned from the best experts around. And then Dr. Watkins and myself are talking about the mental, the psychology, the emotion. It, it's, um, and we're talking about the family. Last synod, we had something about the family, the previous one about the family. You know, you go to so many places, people preach the Bible, you know, superficially and all that, but, but it's these things that embed it. 
and make our, our heavenly race even, even smoother. So Bishop Oji, um, I, I'm always in awe of you and you know that. Uh, thank you and thank uh, your wife, Madam Lillian, for all that you do. So we, we have, um, just to, to, to set some, some, some signposting for us, in the course of our, this talk, I, I'm hoping we'll be able to attain the following objectives. The first is to understand, have some understanding of the distinction between clinical depression and what we would consider as normal variations of mood. I would also like us to, to have some better understanding of how to recognize depression in a family member, how to understand and support a family member with depression, um, and better understanding of depression and its treatment from a biblical perspective. So how do we, what do we mean by depression? You know, it's um, if what it is fairly commonly used, but what do we mean by it, especially in a clinical context? So it's a mood disorder and it's one associated with a whole variety of different things. One of those is a persistent feeling of sadness, a loss of interest in usually pleasurable activities. It is also associated with negative perceptions of oneself, of the world, and of the future. A feeling of severe despondency and dejection. A reduced ability to enjoy life. And a wide variety of several different physical and emotional problems. How does that differ from normal variations of mood? If the weather is bad, you know, you probably feel a bit down, traffic is bad, little argument with your wife, or some bad day at the office, we feel down. But typically we autocorrect, we, we self-soothe, and we usually find the ability intrinsic, even without knowing or doing anything about it, we, we get better within a couple of days. But when we have these things persistent, and enough, persistent and severe enough to interfere with our day-to-day -day functioning, to stop us from living our life, doing things we would ordinarily be able to do, then we're talking about a clinical syndrome referred to as depression. I've um, talked about depression in a largely Nigerian, to a largely Nigerian audience, and I challenged everybody there. It was people from all races, to, people to tell me what word for depression in their language. I am Ibo and Dr. Bijofor, with all her proficiency, I doubt she will be able to tell me a word that everybody else that is Ibo would understand to mean depression. It just doesn't exist, in quotes, but it's there, we know. So we don't have any vocabulary and Ibo vocabulary is perhaps one of the most recent and most incomplete. So we don't have depression, unlike our Caucasian friends. So typically it is, Again, inspired by Dr. Bijo Fozibo, Ihe Mereme, something that was done, some <laughs> spiritual infraction or something. People go to um, all sorts of traditional healers to, to treat their depression. So depression, in other words, then is when you have all these, some of these factors I described above in a persistent and severe enough way to interfere with day-to-day -day life. And some of us, from the third world countries originally, we struggle with understanding the concept of depression and dealing with it. And it's one of the biggest challenges we have in developing nations today. So how common is depression? So from clinical research and anecdotal evidence, we know depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide, and also a major contributor to the overall disease burden globally. Unfortunately, the prevalence is continually rising. We know it to be fairly commoner in women than in men. We know it to be affecting approximately 5% of the global population right now. We know that some, some evidence suggests Brazil will be the country with the highest levels of depression, followed very closely by the United States of America. In Nigeria, the, the, in Africa as a whole, it is rising steadily. We don't have any immediate data, maybe reliable data, but we know it is fastly rising. 
in my community where I grew up, I lived there for almost 30 years before I left. I didn't see one single case of suicide. But now I would imagine most Nigerians would know or have heard about somebody who died of suicide when my dad would never have ever heard about that. So the incidence is clearly rising. We also know that one in six of us will experience depression in a lifetime. I think it was in the last scene out I joked, but, but seriously also conveyed the, the information that one in four people have mental health challenges. Um, most times, the most commonly depression. Uh, and I tell people, if you have four friends and three of them are normal, then check yourself. If you have four friends, three of them are normal, please endeavor to see me after this and uh, I would have a talk with you. <laughs> so how can we recognize depression? What are the symptoms, the signs and symptoms of depression? If a family member, if a church member had depression, what might we see? I would break this down into four domains, the behavioral features, the, the feelings, things we may see as behaviors, things a person may be feeling that we may perceive or not, things, the kind of thinking processes that person might have, we may perceive or not, but the person will clearly know. And physical, physical conditions. Again, we're able to see those ones. So behaviorally, we notice this person is not going out anymore as they used to. They're kind of withdrawn from friends and family, isolating themselves, maybe in their rooms, maybe they are, they are, not coming out for the dinner, they want to take their own food in their room, which is unusual. I mean, people could be that way naturally, but this will become a deviation from the norm for them. People are not getting things done and we begin to see people rely on alcohol and drugs. Again, that is even worse with the pandemic lockdown. The feelings a person might with depression, things you, you would notice in yourself if you are depressed would be feeling overwhelmed, feeling irritable, feeling indecisive, feeling sad, feeling miserable, among others. Thoughts, what kind of thinking are we going in the mind of a person with depression? Usually very negative thinking. Um, it, it is, remember we, we in, the, in the definition of depression, usually, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but, but there is that negative thinking about oneself, about the world about, and about the future. So some common thoughts would be, I'm a failure. I am worthless. Life is not worth living. People will be better off without me. Nothing good ever happens to me. The world is unfair and things like that. People are unreliable. Physically, people notice they'll be tired all the time or most of the time. There'll be difficulties with sleep, initiating sleep, sustaining sleep, losses in appetite, loss of appetite or changes in appetite weight gain, weight loss, headaches, body pains, and a general feeling of malaise, feeling sick and run down. So in other times, when people are depressed, there's a persistent lassitude, a melancholy that simply won't go away, no matter how good life seems to be around you. So you're in a place, you know, one of the most profound things I experience in my work is postpartum depression. A woman has a baby. After nine months of pregnancy, no matter how much they wanted this baby, hormonal changes, um, sleep deprivation, and everything else going on, you tell a woman, oh, lovely baby, I love your baby. <laughs> oh, thank you. They're crying to say thank you to you. It's so heartbreaking, and I see that because I do perinatal psychiatry. So life seems to be going well around you, but you're down. In other terms, your person feels numb, feels lethargic, as if you're running in a battery that is slowly, slowly fading away on you. Imagine walking in a river against the stream, the flow of the water. You know, you're having to push. You're having to push, right? Being in a hole and feel you can't climb out of it. You cry, but it's not, a help. It's not enough. Rage, irritability, those things don't help you. Even more profoundly for us as Christians, you've prayed all your mind. It's not going away. And brethren, for those who don't have depression, it can be very, very difficult to understand. It can be extremely difficult to understand depression. 
So what are the types of depression? What kind of types of depression do we know about? We have major depressive depression, major depressive disorder, which is the typical kind of depression when, like I said before, people, you feel down in a sustained way, severe enough to interfere with day-to-day -day life. This is different from seasonal affective disorder. It's kind of more common in Canada, I would imagine, because we have very sharp distinctions. When it's winter, it's cold, and you don't go out of the house. You're you're deprived of sunshine. When it's summer, you, you know you you kind of being survive with a shed on. You have to nearly want to strip yourself. So those sharp distinctions tend to result in seasonal variations in mood that is severe enough to to interfere with life. We also have persistent depressive disorder, and these are people who have that sub syndromal. You know, they're not severely depressed, they're still meeting up with most challenges of the day to day life, but they are very, you know, like the cartoon character E or, you know, it's just a grumble. You know, you just probably know somebody in your social network or close to your work or something who they just never feel good. They're not severely depressed, but then it's like they're driving the, the shift, you know, the gear, cars with shift gear. Rather than on gear five, you're driving on gear three from Houston to Dallas. You will get there, but you get there late. You run down, you wear down your engine, you burn more gas, you destroy the atmosphere. You, you know, so it's almost like going on a gear three on a shift gear car. But you also have bipolar depression, and these are people who have who are depressed at one time, and they can be manic or hypomanic at other times. So that is like the opposites, but they also are able to have a period of normalcy between those. The sign of the time now is COVID-19 and how is that impacting on depression? We know there's a pervasive sense of loss, loss of job, loss of freedom and autonomy, loss of the certainty of the future, people you could predict People could buy their ticket to travel back to Nigeria or go for some, for vacation. Once they come back from one vacation, they book for the next one. Now, planning weddings, planning nothing. It's just that loss of that certainty alone, autonomy. So grief. And the worst part of the loss is secondary losses. You have somebody, you lose somebody, and you can't even go for the funeral. Those things that help you to attain closure, you can't even practice them. You can't congregate as families and friends to mourn, to support each other. So you have a loss and then you have downstream secondary losses. Grief and complex grief effects because of the complexity of the situation. Deep fear and uncertainty arising from the virus and as I said earlier on. So as I've said in previous presentations on this subject, every one of us will be and is being affected psychologically. In relative times, COVID-19 will infect, I-N-F-E-C-T, will infect relatively few people, but will affect everybody psychologically. Hence, the reason for us to, to be doing this today. There's no health without mental health. We know that. So once you're affected psychologically, your health has taken a good hit. So we know there's been increasing rates of stress, rates of anxiety, rates of depression, Rates of addiction, not just alcohol and drugs, process addictions like gambling, like pornography, it's terrible. Domestic violence, some marriages worked because, you know, both parties left, maybe the man went to work in the morning, he, he came back, the wife left for work at night and they just focus on the kids and their needs and just very pragmatic, transactional type relationship. But now everybody's at home. These people never watched the same. They don't have any TV programs they enjoy watching together. So whoever holds the remote control controls the TV for the day and little things before you know it is fight. And so a lot of domestic violence, very terribly high. There is that siege mentality, cabin fever, fake news, 5G and COVID, end times, anti-vaxxers. How many of us here will assure we'll take the vaccine if it comes out because of everything we're hearing? Yeah, I see Dr. Bijofor raising her hand and she's our model. 
please let's take the vaccine. Once Dr. Fauci and the scientists tell us it's okay, please, we have to take our vaccines. So these are all leading to a pandemic of depression, a pandemic of depression. And the church has a role in this. The clergy have a role in this. It is providing that atmosphere, making use of social media and everything else we're doing. Like, I mean, what a wonderful scene. I would love to see everybody, but what, what an amazing show we've put up here in the next two days. I'm almost thinking, should we be having two scene out a year? Because this is awesome. So it is things like this. Treatment of depression. So the treatment settings, you have for mild depression, typically family doctors are sufficient. I tell people the most potent antidepressant ever is praise and worship. If you doubt me, go to Nigeria. That is how those men and women are living day to day. You go to church, you sing your heart out, you trust God, you have faith, you believe there is a tomorrow, you believe there is a next week, you believe there is a next year, and you march on. Without praise and worship, the suicide rate in Nigeria right now, and many African countries, will be 100 times higher. You just need to be on social media and see what is going on now. But these people, gather, they pray, they worship God, and they move on. So for mild depression, family doctors, church, pastoral care, usually sufficient. Moderate to severe, please endeavor to see a psychiatrist. Please endeavor to see a psychiatrist. When it comes to medical treatment, we have antidepressant type medications. There's a wide variety of them. Your doctor, a family doctor, a psychiatrist will be able to initiate treatment when it is appropriate to do so. We also have psychotherapy. So what I, I have this cycle pie chart I draw in my office, it's pills, one pie, one pie, therapy, one pie, and self-care and the other one, all of them being equal. So I tell people the antidepressants I'll prescribe are necessary at the point, I'll consider them necessary, but not sufficient necessary but not sufficient. So even if you took my antidepressants and got 100% benefit from them, you will only have 30% of what you need. So it's necessary, but it's far from sufficient. What else do you need? Psychotherapy, counseling. It could be from your pastor. It could be from your wife. It could be from a lot. But most times before you're seeing me as a psychiatrist, you need formal counseling from um, a, a specialist. What else do we need? Self-care. What is self-care? I presume all the things we learned in kindergarten. I tell people that if you stopped going to school after kindergarten, if you are privileged to have one, many of us from Nigeria don't even know what kindergarten means growing up. But if you are privileged to have one, you don't even need to go to school any further to be a healthy person and to be a good citizen. Because it was in kindergarten you learned to Finish your fruit and veg, go to bed on time, wake up on time, look before you cross the road, say please, say thank you, clean up, clean up after you. Everything that makes you a good citizen, makes you a healthy person, you already knew. So I tell my patients, self-care means rebooting yourself, resetting yourself to factory setting. It means it's like the way you turn off your phone to reboot it when it's giving you a problem, you go back to your childhood. We know what Christ said. You have to be like a child to enter the kingdom of God. So those things, it's like going back to the factory setting and then beginning to problem solve and grow from there. So antidepressants, psychotherapy, and self-care. What are the practical elements of self-care? Again, diets, exercise, sleep hygiene, sleep, sleep, sleep. People don't emphasize it enough. Sleep hygiene, very important. And then go to church, pray, connect with people, positive attitude, positive outlook in life, gratitude, helping others. All those things are part of self-care as Christians, loving your neighbor, not only in word, but in deed as well. So let's look at depression from the biblical perspective. 
this has been research for the most part, educational career. But, but what does the Bible say about depression? And it's, it's been around forever, but, but as currently conceptualized, it's a relatively new term, perhaps this 20th century, I would say. But, but as a disorder, depression actually exists in virtually all ancient texts, including, of course, our own Bible. In Proverbs 12, 25, it says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. There are biblical scholars here, people who understand the linguistics. The word way down in that context is said to refer to the Hebrew word shaka, S-H-A-C-H-A-H, shaka, meaning to depress. So as Christians, we're taught to tackle life's problems through prayer, through faith, through spiritual practices. And we often struggle to understand when we have a battle with depression because suddenly we meet something that just typically wouldn't go away, no matter how hard we pray. When the book of Psalms, very rife with depression, people would say that the, the Psalms were, were written by King David during extremely low periods of his own life. So in Psalm 143, 47, it says, so my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed, answer me quickly. Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I'll be like those who go down to the pit. There are lots of other references, particularly in the book of Psalms, Psalm 3, 3, 23, 1 to 6, 30 verse 5, 30 verse 11, 34 verse 18, 77, 4, 102. It's uh, so much of that. In, in the book of Kings, 1 Kings, Elijah made King Ahab understand how much evil the ruler had done. It was said that, that Ahab fasted. He slept in mourning clothes to mourn. And he walked around depressed. First Kings 21, 27. In the book of Samuel, King Samuel was said to be so depressed, he sank into fits of despair and rage. First Samuel 16, 20. We know about Job. So depressed, he declared he wished he had never been born. Now, but Elijah he sank into depression after he was forced to flee for his life into the desert. He even begged God to take his own life. First King 19.4. What about Jonah? He became bitterly and angrily depressed over his ordeal, over God's decision to spend in event. Jonah 4, 1 to 11. So we see time after time, the Bible is presenting us with stories of depressed people crying out to God, begging for help, or even begging him to just take the pain away, take their life away. Besides David and Saul, there are other Bible characters that wrestled hard with depression and mood disorders. So we have the Book of Lamentations, said to be a poetic expression of the deep depression of the people of Hebrew after the fall of Jerusalem. We have Moses crying to the Lord about the burden of the task of leading the people of Israel. In Numbers 11, 14 to 15, he says, if this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. Prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2014, he struggled depression throughout his days. At one of his lows, he cursed the day he'd been born. And perhaps one of the most profound and one of the most popular would be Judas Iscariot, becoming so overwhelmed with guilt and pain over the sin of betraying Jesus, he even took his own life by hanging. When it comes to treating depression, the Bible also has things to tell us. So as with all problems we face as humans, there's one thing we can always do with depression, bring it to God. Take it to God in prayers and in his word. So our Lord Jesus Christ himself acknowledged the weight of our problems, our troubles, physical, emotional. He promised us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. We know, brethren, true hope does lie in God. However, it's important to understand that just like we put our hope and faith in God, it doesn't mean all our problems will go away, like cancer, there is diabetes, there's high blood pressure, there is asthma, there's other diseases. Sometimes we'll have some of these things bear this burden for the rest of our earthly life. But brethren, be rest assured on resurrection morning, we will wake up, of course, free again from these diseases. 
In the Christian community, many people view depression as a result of not praying enough, as a result of not having enough faith, as a result of not serving God enough. There is this perception that good Christians don't get depressed. And nothing could be further from the truth than that. So as for whether or not to take medications for depression, the Bible doesn't tell us that specifically. But Jesus, in his life and ministry, made it clear that healing and seeking healing is a good thing. He also acknowledged, a lot Jesus Christ acknowledged that the sick need a doctor. We can refer to Matthew 9, 12 for that. What are the practical steps we need to, we could observe or incorporate into our lives as Christians to help ourselves and help people around us regarding depression? We need to put on the full armor of God. We need to remember this is a spiritual world we're in, life in general. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We know that, Ephesians 6, 6 12. I want us to listen to this carefully. We need to be transformed by renewing the renewing of our minds. Make a list of recurring lies that play over and over in your head. I said earlier on, in depression, we feel negative about ourselves, about the future, about the world. And one cardinal thing is negative thoughts pop into our head. Dr. Watkins will teach better about cognitive behavior therapy, understanding how our thoughts linked are linked to our feelings and therefore our behaviors. So putting on the full up, sorry, renewing your mind, making a list of those lies. And every time those things happen, write out God's truth beside it. When your mind is lingering on the enemy's distorted reality, replace it immediately with a scripture that speaks God's truth over that lie. In Philippians, for it says, set your minds on whatever it is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Let's fill our thoughts with those and reach from reading the scriptures. We need to walk in Christian community, connect with ourselves, supporting each other, in battling grief, depression, and all that. We need to seek godly counseling. In Psalm 16, 7, it says, first seek counsel from God. We need to seek that counseling from God. We need to take extra care of our physical needs. I've said this before, and it's, it's what it what's repeating. Exercise, even if it means running up and down your staircase in the house. Eating healthily, sleeping, taking medications when they're recommended to you. And remembering that our body is a temple, temple of God, and we need to take very good care of it. We need to embrace the concept of time. This too will pass away. There's time for everything. Depression, luckily, is episodic. It will pass away even if it comes again later. Be relentless in friendship, in camaraderie with family, with your fellow church members who are struggling with depression. Be that friend that loves them fiercely. Be that friend that helps them climb out of that, that hole. And as I said before, verses of hope. There are lots of verses in the Bible that deal with depression. Writing these down and using them to inspire yourself or inspire the family member. A gratitude journal. What is it you're, you're happy for? What are those things you're happy for? No matter how mundane they seem. Write these things down. Something to be thankful for every day. As many things as you can remember. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. We also need to cultivate that culture of transparency even in the church, an open forum where people can talk about their challenges and get the support that they need. You know, one of the best ways to help ourselves is helping others. Go to Matthew 25, go to the Sermon on the Mount. You see, one of my, 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 my the greatest parts of the Bible for me is, it's love your God, love your neighbor. Those are us. Upon these lie of the prophets and all the law. No command, no law is greater than all those. And how do we do that? Helping ourselves, helping each other, being that person that is there for ourselves. So we also have to think about, in, it's important to emphasize how to prevent depression because uh, Dr. Bidio said the prevention is better than cure. 
again, some of these things I've pretty much talked about is that attitude of gratitude. Is that engaging in worship of God, praise and worship, helping others, diet, exercise, sleep, fidelity to your cultural values. You know, most of us from Africa, we, we have a system that works for us. My friends just come here and knock on the door and I open the door. They don't need to call me and say, are you there? Can I come? Da, da, da. But, but we need to find a way to not totally forget our roots, forget those things that we, we, we've already been genetically primed, so to say. So however we, whatever we do to instill that sense of identity will help us. Interpersonal connections and emotional intelligence. If you don't take anything away from me today, if you're a reader, if you like to read, pick up a book called Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, Daniel Goleman. Pick it up, read it, and um, I can tell you certainly one of the best things I've read in my life, and um, you would find it helpful. It's not written for medical doctors alone. You would understand it. It will help you. So um, I don't want to take more. I could go on, but, but, but in summary, I just want us to remind, remember that depression, like other diseases, might be something we, can, we can't always find a cure for. As Christians, we need to take comfort in knowing that having depression sometimes could be that part of suffering, being that part of a suffering fellowship. Not only today, but among many other strong and faithful leaders, including through the Bible. And as with all hardships, we need to remember to set our sights on God. We need to remember to draw our strength from God. In spite of the difficulty that can be, that can be a very big help. And perhaps sometimes that can be all we can actually do. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, I will look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Izu Mwachuku. Uh, as some of you know, Dr. Izu is in uh, Calgary, Alberta. Uh, it's already snowing uh, out there, very cold. Uh, but the rest of us uh, who love heat uh, in Texas. So, uh, so thank you, Doc. Uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, I'm going to interrupt the uh, panel. We're going to come back to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, and then at the end, I will do my appropriate uh, thank yous to all the uh, members of the panel. Uh, I have the, and of, of course, if you have questions, uh, keep uh, writing your questions uh, in the right forum. Uh, we'll get to your questions. Uh, I have the honor of introducing uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, both of us are graduates of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, the most Reverend Dr. Foley Beach. Uh, Archbishop Foley Beach uh, has joined us online. Uh, he is the Bishop of the Anglican Diocese of the South, uh, also the primate of the Anglican Church in North America uh, in his second, uh, se second uh, term now. Uh, Archbishop Foley Beach is also the chairman of GAFCON. Uh, those of you who don't know what GAFCON is, uh, Archbishop Beach is going to talk about it. Uh, so he's a good friend. Thank you so much, Your Grace, uh, for joining us. I know you're traveling all over the world. Stay away from COVID. Uh, so thank you for joining us uh, in our diocese and synod. Please uh, speak to us and pray for us as well. Thank you, Bishop. It's so good to be with you. By the way, can you hear me? Okay, I just want to make sure you hear me. Can you shake your head? Yes. Okay, great. Well, Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you today. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, after hearing uh, the good doctor a few minutes ago, um, I just want to say I, I'm very encouraged. Can everybody hear the Archbishop well? Your Grace, can you hold on for a moment? Uh, okay. Can you hear? Yes. So I am unmuted. Can you hear me okay, Bishop Felix? It's garbled, Your Grace. It's, it's garbled. Okay, let me try something else. Um, let's see. How is that, is that better? 
Log back in, okay? Okay. Okay. Be right back. Pa perfect. It's clear now. We can hear you. Oh, now you can. Yes, we can. You hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I yes. can hear you. Is that better? Would you like me to go ahead or, or log back in? Yes, this is great. Yeah. Okay, it's good. All right. Well, um, let me start over. Bishop uh, Felix, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Um, I do count you as a friend and a brother. And uh, a partner in the gospel of Jesus, um, we have our task ahead of us, don't we? Um, also, uh, uh, it's been really a privilege to get to know um, Archbishop Henry. Uh, and he is also a tremendous uh, man of God, a heart for mission, a desire for people to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And uh, he's been a wonderful partner with the GAFCON primates. A grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, may his peace, especially during this time, be with you all, uh, especially as you seek to encounter the various challenges that, that we have put upon us. Um, as the chair of the GAFCON primates, just want to let you know that we have met uh, several times this summer by Zoom, and I'm actually actually quite encouraged by uh, what uh, uh, our relationships are and, the, and the, the vision ahead. GAFCON stands for the Global Anglican Future Conference. And it's a group of Anglicans, actually it's the majority of Anglicans in the Anglican communion who are seeking to bring revival and repentance and renewal to the Anglican communion, uh, to bring the Anglican communion back into line with the teaching of the Bible and the witness of Jesus Christ. Uh, I have to say, uh, one of the things that's been really challenging for me personally is in talking with so many of my fellow primates, the challenges they are facing with COVID you know, here in the United States and in North America, um, we have stimulus checks, we have unemployment insurance, uh, some of us have credit cards, uh, some of us have savings. Um, in most of those places, uh, they work for their food that week. And it's a cash society, and if you don't work, then you don't have money to buy food. And in so many places, the the priest of his village is also the leader of the village. And often, and when people have need or uh, they would come to the priest for help, but when the priest can't even feed his own family, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge. And so I'm sure many of you have been in touch with folks um, uh, in Nigeria and other places of, of the world, but I just wanna encourage you to, uh, if you have relationships with folks, to check in with them and see how you might be able to help. Uh, because we really do have it uh, privileged here in the United States, as difficult it has been uh, compared to the rest of the world, uh, we're in heaven. Uh, they, a lot of folks are really, really suffering. Um, I wanted to also let you know that um, Bishop Ben Kwashi, um, Archbishop Ben, who is uh, a great friend uh, of mine, but also the General Secretary of GAFCON. Many of you may have heard he was diagnosed with cancer, um, and he was receiving treatment in uh, Nigeria. Actually, I understand Mama Gloria, um, actually gave him his first chemo uh, at their house. Uh, but Bishop Quig Lawrence, who's one of the bishops in the Diocese of, the, of Christ Our Hope, um, has worked out to have uh, Archbishop Ben and Gloria come to receive treatment in Roanoke, Virginia. And um, uh, because of the, uh, all of a sudden, the onslaught of violence um, in Lagos, uh, they went under a 24-hour curfew. Some of you may know this already. And uh, it's been very, very tough for some folks, but, but the planes, uh, the airport was shut down. But uh, the good news is as I'm speaking to you, um, he is on a plane right now to Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, then we'll catch a plane to Roanoke, Virginia, uh, where he should land tomorrow uh, mid morning. And he's got an appointment on Monday uh, with a, a specialist and it looks like surgery will be on Friday. And so I want to encourage you to keep Archbishop Ben in your prayers. 
Uh, it looks like this is a treatable kind of cancer, but, but you know, these things you never know. And uh, we want to pray that the Lord will heal him and his body will respond correctly to the, uh, to the treatment. Um, here in North America, um, as most of you all know, we've been facing quite a challenge, not just with COVID, but the racial strife that we've been encountering. And then uh, this uh, heated election that we're in, which seems to be so vicious. And I, I just want to report in and talking to clergy around North America, uh, most of our clergy are exhausted, uh, worn out uh, in trying to shepherd the sheep uh, in trying to actually most leaders are in, in any profession, but, but especially the clergy. And so for those of you who are delegates to this uh, synod uh, and you're not clergy, I want to encourage you to reach out and love on your love on your clergy um, and uh and take care of them. Uh, Bishop Felix gave an excellent address to Synod uh, earlier, and uh, I have to say, Bishop Felix, I may want to borrow some of that for my Synod coming up in a, <laughs> in a few weeks. But, but, what he said, but what he said about clergy and paying your clergy and taking care of your clergy is so important. And um, one of the things I say to vestries uh, and vestry members, I'll, I'll ask this question. I'll say, could, could you support your family on what you're paying your priest. Um, if you can, then, then okay. But but most priests are well underpaid and are not earning what they deserve. But not only that, if, if you have not been able to give them rest and time off recently, um, I want to, and, and for the clergy here, I want to encourage you, if you've not taken time off and taken rest, uh, to try to build it into your schedule in the next few weeks. Because um, like the good doctor said earlier, um, if we're not getting rest and exercise and taking care of ourself, um, you're setting yourself up for trouble. And uh, so many of our clergy, um, and I know in your diocese as well, are bivocational, which means you're working another job and then you're trying to serve the church on top of that. And it can be very, very difficult. So, uh, so that would be my encouragement to you is to find time to take rest. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I did want to let you know I'm I'm in um, Peachtree City, Georgia. Mama Allison and I have just traveled here. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Peachtree City is just south of Atlanta. Tomorrow, I have a visitation at All Saints uh, Church at Peachtree City with confirmations and baptisms, and and I and I get to preach. So I'm very excited about that. So, uh, Bishop uh, Felix, anything else you wanted me to add at this point or uh, question? No, Your Grace, uh, this has been good. Thank you so much for making time uh, to, to address our Synod. Uh, our prayer and our hope and our efforts, we're going to building relationships. Uh, we know things have happened in the past, uh, but by the grace of God, uh, we'll continue to build that relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ as we pursue our common mission uh, here in, in North America and around the world. Uh, thank you for your friendship. Uh, thank you for your love. Uh, keep uh, praying for us, and uh, uh, let's uh, keep moving forward. And uh, we, we love Atlanta, Georgia. So I can see Canon Tassi uh, looking at me here. Uh, so, <laughs> so he's your neighbor there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so thank you. And uh, my, my speech is not copyrighted, so your grace, please use it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you can send me $100, you know, I think that would be, that'd be nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's so good to see so many familiar faces um, and, uh, and, and friends in the Lord. So let me pray for you all, and then I'll uh, let you continue with your meeting. The Lord be with you. Nice nice Our Father, we come in Jesus' name, and I thank you for these, your servants. Thank you for Bishop Orgy, and I thank you for Bishop Arona and Bishop Steve. Thank you for uh, all that you are doing in this diocese. And Lord, as each of us face the challenges ahead, I ask for an extreme measure of your grace and your peace to saturate each member of this diocese. Uh, give them incredible anointing as they seek to do their ministry. And Lord, help us all be faithful in reaching everyone in North America with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, there are so many suffering right now, so many in pain, so many that are lost that do not know you and need to know you. And so we pray you give us grace to be able to reach them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank Bye. you so much, Your Grace. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be with you. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh,
All right, uh, Dr. Biagaliu Abijofo, we are, we are going to swing back uh, to the uh, panel discussion at this point. Uh, maybe I should use this opportunity uh, to thank uh, Dr. Abijofo. Uh, she's a medical director uh, for our diocese. Uh, this morning she had called me and we were talking about uh, today and she said, um, you know, she's looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, I said to her, well, you're going to be doing this every year. Uh, so she said, but I didn't tell her at the beginning. I said, yes, I didn't, because if I did, uh, you wouldn't say, you, you wouldn't agree. So, uh, Dr. Begeli, this is a lifetime commitment and ministry. Uh, so we, we love you and we love to hear you. Uh, now you're teaching all of us Igbo proverbs, uh, all the things I've forgotten. And you've converted Dr. Izu, uh, who have never heard speak proverb before. So, um, so you're making an impact. <laughs> you know, so thank you, Dr. Begeli. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Michael Watkins. Uh, uh, Dr. Michael Watkins uh, is my bishop's warden in San Antonio, uh, St. Benedict. Uh, we've been friends for many, many years. He's a forensic psychologist and has actually helped me in addressing some issues uh, some years ago, uh, very pointedly and very well. Uh, so, so he's a good friend. Uh, Dr. Izu, also thank you so much again. Uh, we become really very good friends. Uh, so, so, so uh, these are great presentations. Get the scripts as well uh, for for the clergy to uh, to go home and for the bishop to read. You know, as well. Yeah. So. Uh, I love to get the scripts for, for all of us. Uh, so we are, we are turning it back to um, uh, Dr. Obiegeli. Uh, there are some questions for all of you and then she will guide us uh, in answering those questions. Yeah, so. Thank you very much, my Lord Bishop. Uh, thank you, Dr. Michael Watkins. Thank you, Dr. Izumachupu. Thank you guys for the excellent presentations. So now we're ready to take questions. Um, I don't have any of the questions in front of me, so I guess maybe Bishop or whoever has the questions can read them out, and then whoever the question is directed to will unmute their uh, speaker and then answer. I think that will work best. Oh, one more thing. I want to thank Reverend Rob Goodman. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to help me set up. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Okay. Questions. Okay. Hi, Dr. Obi. Yes, sir. The first uh, couple of questions are directed uh, to you. If numbers are continuing to go up until a cure is found and masking and distancing must continue, the first question is how does one do that? as airlines are beginning to open up all seats and all flights? Okay, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much for that question. So, so ideally, sorry, one second. My husband's computer is echoing in my ear. So I'm gonna mute for a second. <laughs> yeah, we can get the dean to shut him down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, I'm back. So, so ideally, we should really postpone our travels, but I know it's not possible to postpone travel. So here's what you would do, or here's what I would do if I had to fly. First of all, I'll wear an N95 mask to fly. I would also wear a face shield in addition to my N95 mask. Then I will try to get my seat as close to the front of the airplane as possible because the air in the airplane flows from front to back. And uh, the good news is so far it appears that the transmission risk in the aircraft itself is low. It's not, it's not what we feared would happen. We haven't seen that. So yes, you can fly, wear an N95, add a face shield, get your seat as close to the front as possible. Now, if you're able by checking your seats to see where the empty seats are. If you're able to have an empty seat in between you and the next person, do that. If you have the money, if you're able to upgrade yourself to business class, do that, or first class, do that.
But if you must fly coach, get to as close to the front of the aircraft as possible and do those things. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Obi. The second question uh, is also directed to you. Uh, this virus will never be gone. Once it's here, the only way is to continue correct behaviors and management. Isn't that so? Yes, yes. From what we're seeing, it doesn't look like this is going to disappear. It might end up being like, so if we go back to 1918, the Spanish flu, they had three waves. So it went for at least two years, okay? So far, we've had three waves and we're eight months into it. It doesn't look like it's going anywhere. Um, our hope is next year when the vaccines are available, that enough people would get vaccinated. So it's one thing to have the vaccines. Enough people have to be vaccinated for us to achieve a herd immunity. So if the vaccines come and only 40% of the country gets vaccinated because of all these anti-vaxxers and all those uh, conspiracy theories out there, then we're not going anywhere with this. But if at least 60% of the population, at least 60% has to get vaccinated, then we will get close to that herd immunity and things will get better. But until then, please wear your masks, physically distance. Thanksgiving is coming up. Look at your local transmission rate before you plan your Thanksgiving dinners. If your test positivity is greater than single digits, please do not gather. If it's in the single digits, so right now when I'm in, Tex in Houston, Texas, here, uh, as of yesterday, our positivity rate was about 8%. So that's great compared to in June when it was 25%. So if you must gather, you want to gather outside. Even when you're outside, remember to distance. Don't forget. So that's all we can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Obi. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Mike. And the question is this, what happens when I come to understand that my wife is the cause of the dysfunction in our family? <laughs> can you take the fifth? <laughs> I would suggest you don't engage in blaming just to start with. Uh, recognize that a problem exists. And then I'll give you an idea about uh, a problem solving method. The first question that you need to ask yourself is what is the problem? Okay. And define very clearly exactly what the problem happens to be. Okay. The next question that you should ask yourself is why is it a problem? Okay. And then define very clearly in discussion with your wife, why any particular issue happens to be a problem and then brainstorm with her, what can we do to solve the problem? Any relationship, especially between a husband and wife, it's critical that they main some type of, maintain some type of balance. And the best way to do that is through open and honest communication. Too often, I think that we get off into a situation where we're willing to tell white lies. That's not healthy. It may avoid conflict, Okay, but keep this in the back of your head. You're telling a white lie, you're still telling a lie. It's still dishonest. So open and honest communication is a critical issue in addressing any problem, especially between spouses. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Uh, Dr. Izu, uh, the next question is to you. And the question is this. How does one handle a family member who is an adult who is manifesting signs or symptoms of anxiety uh, with abnormal involuntary facial expressions, distorted thought process, explosive temper, refusal to take responsibility, et cetera? This uh, member has refused to seek professional help, stating that she does not want to take uh, psychotherapy. Uh, Okay, that's another good question. But before I get into this, just to add to what uh, Dr. Watkins said there in, in earlier on, um, something I ask, I ask couples when they come to me with difficulties is, one of the questions I ask them is, this thing you're, you're quarreling about now, is it going to be an issue for you tomorrow? Maybe yes. Will it be an issue for you next week? Maybe yes. Next year? Certainly not. Two years? Certainly not. Ten years? Certainly not. 
So if it's if something is not going to be an issue for me next week or next year or next, wh why wh why would I why would I be fighting over it to that extent? Another thing is, if you were on your dying bed and you were told you had three months to leave, would you be worrying about this? And usually they say no. So th these kind of questions make people to put their here and now into perspective and hopefully sometimes makes them better able to review uh, what is going on more objectively. But back to the, the question, is it is a, a, an important one, is a good one, but it's a complex one. I would have liked to know a few more things if I could give a more direct response, how, much, how long this is going on and what else is going on. There is always a context to this. And sometimes people mislabel somebody standing their ground to, you know, um, they have been mentally unwell, anger issues, blah, blah, blah. So it's also always important to understand the context that this is happening. But on the face of it, it looks like this is quite serious and this person needs to get help. Um, I believe by all of us being here, this person asking this question is one of us. I will say, talk to your pastor, for example, talk to your priest. Hopefully your priest will be somebody you can engage with. Your priest could call um, the, 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 the wife and, uh, and maybe begin some counseling at that level. And then hopefully if she's more persuaded, she could get more professional help if it's, if it's absolutely needed. So um, even in our culture, I would involve her family, not my family, find somebody within her own family that she respects um, talk to them and get them to to maybe call her attention to what is the what appears to be the need for here. Thank you, Dr. Izu. I believe those are all the questions that have come in through the moderators at this point. Okay, somebody put a general question here. I'll read it out. They put it in the chat. It says to me, um, why is wearing a mask not enough? in the aircraft, why, why also a, a face shield? So that's an excellent question. So re remember what I said about the risk of transmission. So the longer you are in a situation where you're close to somebody, the higher the risk. So in an aircraft, typically you're not flying for 30 minutes. You're gonna be in that situation for an hour at least or maybe more. So, so you're gonna be in that situation for longer. So you want to take all the necessary precautions. So the mask will do its job. The, the face shield also helps protect your mucous membranes, the eyes, the nose. If, and of course, remember at some point you gotta take your mask off to eat if you're gonna eat in the aircraft. So it's just putting an extra layer of protection since you're gonna be in that risky situation for a longer time. That's why I added the face shield. You may choose not to worry, but you know, as many things as you can put on. So that's why. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Obi. Uh, for, for everyone on uh, the Zoom Synod, uh, if you can direct your questions uh, to dowsynodhelp at gmail.com or text them to 210-580-6567. And I'll say that again, 210 580-6567, uh, that will help us uh, substantially rather than everyone asking uh, a ton of questions on the Zoom chat. Bishop Seeley, we have a question here for Dr. Izu. How can we uh, possibly support children who are in care of a depressed or disruptive family? And there's another depression question you might like to answer at the same time, which is, how do you advise avoid being or becoming depressed? Okay, thank you. Again, good questions. Let's talk about the prevention, first of all. It's, um, we can prevent depression only to an extent. Some depression is very biological. It is, um, and it will just happen. For example, postpartum depression. How do you prevent that? Not have a baby? No, you have to have a baby. If you, if you have to. So, um, so there's only an extent to which we can de prevent depression. I'm emphasizing this because this somehow underlies some of the stigma. So if people become depressed, oh, you didn't work hard enough, or oh, you didn't do enough to prevent it. No, 
we need to understand that depression, if any of us here is subjected to sufficient stress, we will become depressed. It's a bit like when you're bereaved, you're quote unquote depressed, even though not clinically, but, but if you're subjected to that more intensity and severity of that stress, you will become depressed. So prevention, it's almost like how do you live healthy? Again, I talked about kindergarten, all those things you learned in kindergarten, all those things you learned as a child, what a mother, te a good mother teaches her child, go to bed on time, um, don't, uh, eat healthy, sleep healthy, exercise, positive attitude, positive outlook, things like that. Connect with people. In, we are all, I came to North America and I began to hear about independence. We're all independent. No, human beings were meant to be interdependent, not independent. So connect with each other. Mindfulness, stay in the present, in the here and now. Depression mostly is about worrying about the past. Anxiety comes from worrying about the future. So the more present you are, the better. So find little things that ground you. It could be running a bath. It could be um, doing a game night with your family. It could be, um, you know, for me, I'm learning to play the keyboard. It could be just staying there playing that and just focusing on that, being in the moment. So these are some examples of things we can do, but, but I need to emphasize even doing all these, of course, pray, go to church, fellowship and all that. But sometimes those are just not enough. And we need to be compassionate for with people who happen to become depressed even after doing all those. So for the for the for the children, if there is if you're seriously concerned about their safety, please involve the child and family services. That's what we call them here in Canada. I'm sure they would have similar agencies across the states and all developed world. If you're seriously concerned, get the um, statutory agencies involved. If it's a, a lot less than that, then reach out to the family. Again, we all have people we are most friendly with. Um, you may need to go through some other families or friends that you know are closer to that family and you know, get to reach out to them relentlessly, continuously, providing that offer of help and support. Um, it, it's very important. But, but where those efforts are not sufficient and you're really worried that the children's life or safety would be um, an issue, please reach out to the statutory agencies. Thank you, Dr. Izu. Uh, there's another question here for Dr. Obi. Uh, somebody's concerned with exposure to COVID. They say they've been exposed to COVID. And then you have a five member family or you've got a two bedroom house with one restroom. So how in that kind of situation do you limit the exposure of your other family members when you all have to live together and share the same restroom and kitchen? Okay. Thank you very much. That's an excellent one and a really tough one. So there are five people in the house and one person got exposed and they have to all share one bathroom. Is that is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, it is walkable. How many bedrooms does the house have again? Two bedrooms? Yes, they, they probably, it looks like they just used a two bedroom uh, just for an example, but basically saying limited space family, one person exposed, and you don't want to make everybody else sick. Okay, so you make do with what you have. So that one person who is exposed should take one room and be in that room. The rest should be in the other rooms, or maybe some people sleep in the sitting room. As far as the bathroom, when they go to use the bathroom, they should just make sure they're more than six feet away from the rest of the family, because you can go to use the bathroom, wash your hands, wipe the doors, wipe everything you touch. Have your own utensils. That's when you use uh, disposable plates, disposable cups, spoons. Don't share stuff with the rest of the family and have one room to yourself. That should work. Dr. Obi, we have a, another question directed uh, to you. Uh, how can we know which vaccines are the best? We have heard about some of them controlling our DNAs. Okay, okay, that's an excellent question. So we don't know yet. We have to wait for all these trials to be finished. We have to wait for the companies to publish their data. So we'll see what results they have. When that is done, so that right now there are about five candidates coming up. It looks like the Pfizer vaccine might be the first to come out because they're going to start applying for their own approval at the end of November. So when all that data is around, 
FDA and the powers that be would have to look at the data and then approve. Once they approve, we should, we as a general public should assume that the ones that are approved will work equally. I don't know about superior to, if, they, if the study shows a clear superiority, then they will, well, hopefully they will push the one that's clearly superior and then drop the other ones by the wayside. So right now we don't know yet because the data has not been published. The trials are still ongoing then phase three, but Pfizer seems to be most ahead. It doesn't mean that they're the best. It's just they're most ahead so far. Thank you, Dr. Obi. Thank you. Okay. Bishop, I think that might be uh, all the questions that have come in at this time. All right, um, I'm going to uh, give my final address and then I will, will uh, adjourn the Synod. Uh, so let me see if I can get myself uh, standing up uh, somewhere. Yes. No, 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 he's sitting on top for some reason. You want to come down to come up with it? It's fine.
in unity of spirit by your teaching that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the end of this 2020 Synod of the Anglican Diocese of the West, I would like to say a few things to us very briefly. First, thank you. Max Dupree, in his book titled Leadership is an Art, wrote, and I quote, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. The last is to say thank you. In between, the leader is a servant and a debtor. That sums up the progress of an artful leader." End quote. I want to thank all saints, Anglican Church, the leaders of this church, grateful to Venerable Dr. Ugo Okorafo, who is the rector of this church, and his team. Our gratitude also goes to the music team at this church led by Andrew Ikele. We are grateful to Namdi Oko and his team with the IT. Thank you so much for helping us. I'm also grateful to my Archdeacon Chaplain, Canon Dr. Matthew Ezema, for being here since yesterday. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to express my gratitude as well to the uh, uh, Synod Planning Committee, led by Bishop Scott Seeley and Canon Isaac Reberg and Reverend Dr. Rob Goodman. Uh, this has just been a blessing uh, having you guys coming from San Antonio to make sure that this Synod works out very well. Thank you. I also want to thank our speakers, Venerable Michael Kelshaw, Bishop Scott Seeley, Bishop Celestin Irona, and also those, uh, our panel, uh, Dr. Bijio Four and Dr. Michael and Dr. Izu. Thank you so much. Grateful to the chancellors, legal advisors of the diocese, and the deans of our two cathedrals. Thanks to all of you. I'm grateful to the 213 clergy and laity and the 48 churches that registered for this synod. And to all of our friends who joined us and especially to our primate, the most reverend Henry Ndokoba and his wife who spoke to us this morning and the primate of SCNA, the most reverend Dr. Foley Beach for also addressing us today. Thank you so much all of you. Uh, including our Archbishop, Ikechi Wonsu, who led Nunde prayers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know I've probably forgotten some people. That's why I don't like mentioning names. If your names are forgotten, uh, please forgive me. So thank you as well. Second, I want to ask you, my brothers and sisters, let the Bible control your life, your family, and your ministry. That is part of the DNA of this diocese. We are a Christ-centered, multicultural, bibliocentric diocese that is committed to the mission of the gospel. And so we must let the Bible control our ministry, our mission, our family, our worship, every dimension of our lives so that we can be the church that God intends us to be. That is a church that is committed to Jesus, a church that is committed to the Father and the Holy Spirit, a church that has the gospel at the center of its life, a church that lives by the gospel, breathes the gospel, 
and is committed to proclaiming that gospel. Uh, it reminds me of something that G.K. Chesterton uh, said many years ago, and I quote, he said, we do not want, as the newspapers say, a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world, end of quote. Just in case you missed that, let me say that again. We do not want, as the newspapers say, a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world. And the only way that the church can move the world is by being committed to Jesus Christ, to his gospel, and being committed to his word. And the only way that the families, individuals, and the church can engage mission is also to allow, by allowing the word of God to control our lives. Thirdly, make sure that you are on God's side. Most people claim that God is on their side, but that is the wrong approach. God is not on anybody's side. The right approach is to ensure that you are and that we are as a diocese on God's side. And how do we know that we're on God's side? The way we know that we're on God's side is that we are submitting to the gospel, submitting to the fullness of his word, to his son Jesus Christ, with all sincerity and godliness. And of course, submitting ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We must make sure that we are on God's side. Fourth, ensure that our ministry has the proper focus. And what is the proper focus? Our focus of ministry, in other words, the area of focus of our ministry is all races. Every tongue, every tribe, every race. As I posted this morning on my Facebook page, Nigerian Anglicans in North America are missionaries sent by God to proclaim the gospel to everyone and to plant churches comprising of all races. We are not here for Nigerians only. We are here to preach the gospel to all the heathen in America. Uh, this morning when I was typing my final address, I typed the word heathen and the, my spell check corrected it to Heathrow. Uh, what that tells you is uh, in America, people don't like that word and they don't use it. So my spell check said, changed it to, to Heathrow. Uh, there are so many heathen, as I joked earlier, uh, most of them are in San Antonio. <laughs> or in Washington, D.C., or wherever you want it to be. Uh, so, so my brothers and sisters, uh, this diocese, and I believe all the dioceses of Conan, uh, we are here to proclaim the gospel to every race and plant churches that comprise of every race. We cannot ghettoize the gospel, and we cannot ignore people around us. We have to walk with people in the United States. In the same vein, I want to say to pastors, my brothers who work with me in this pastoral work, do not be discouraged. Pastors, do not be discouraged. I know there are so many things that, that take your time, that frustrate you, that make ministry difficult for you, but I want to ask you, do not be discouraged. God knows what is going on in your lives. I ask you to love your congregations. Pray for them. Put your head down and teach them the Bible. Severing Christ with them. And the Lord will bless your ministry. Make sure your confidence is in Christ and his word rather than in anything else like churchmanship or systems and so on and so forth. You are already accepted in Christ 
continue in Christ. Preach the word of God in season and out of season. Because it is God's word that the Holy Spirit uses to change our lives and to give us hope in the midst of the difficulties of this life. Finally, allow Jesus to be the center of your life, of your ministry, of your mission, of your family, of everything that you do. Daily, we face the temptation of having some good cause be at the center of our lives and ministry. I ask you to resist that. Whether it is good cause in politics or good cause in any particular profession, please do not allow whatever it is to become the center of your life. Jesus must be at the center of our lives. Here is a quote from Henry Nowen. Quote, Jesus has to be and become ever more the center of my life. It is not enough that Jesus is my teacher, my guide, my source of inspiration. It is not even enough that he is my companion on the journey, my friend and my brother. Jesus must become the heart of my heart, the fire of my life, the love of my soul, the bridegroom of my spirit. He must become my only thought, my only concern, my only desire, end of quote. As Paul the Apostle says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its loss. To put on the Lord Jesus Christ means to allow him to take over your life as your savior and your Lord in such a way that everyone who sees you knows and sees that Jesus is all over you. He's all over your desires, all over your ambitions, all over your plans. To put on Christ is to surrender to his love and his agenda. It is to surrender your fears and your troubles to him as you trust and obey him no matter how you feel. Satan will try to get you to take you down. Satan will try to, get, to take you down, but he cannot take you down because you are covered by Jesus. A person who puts on Jesus is now in Jesus, and Jesus is all over him or over her to the praise of God. My brothers and my sisters, I ask you to love one another, help one another, pray for one another, forgive one another, preach the gospel to one another, love God with all your heart, and trust him with all that you have, and he will see you through, and we see us through together. In Jesus' name. Before I pray, I want to make just one announcement. At this 2020 Diocesan Synod of the Anglican Diocese of the West, I want to prefer the following people as canons in this diocese. The Reverend Kingsley Egon as a canon. Kingsley is the rector of the Restoration Anglican Church in the Bronx, New York. So Reverend Kingsley Egon, you're hereby preferred a canon in the Diocese of the West. Also, Reverend Chijuoke Oji. Now, his last name is Oji. Uh, he's not a relative, uh, so don't accuse me of nepotism. <laughs> we are from different parts of Igbo land. Uh, Reverend Chijuoke Oji has excelled in ministry uh, in uh, Ontario, California. Thank you so much uh, for your ministry. I live in faith. Uh, the rector of that parish, you're hereby preferred a canon in the Diocese of the West. And finally, I want to prefer 
Reverend Folusha Falawale John as a canon in our diocese as he continues to serve as director of the Anglican Church of Pentecost and the social media coordinator director of our diocese. So Reverend Folusha Falawale, uh, you are hereby declared a canon of this diocese. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord help you to continue to be faithful to him as you serve the church. Let's clap for them. Before I pray, I think uh, we do have to pass a resolution to adjourn the Senate. So I'm going to do it here. Uh, I'm not sure my chancellor is staying on, but uh, I will function as chancellor at the moment. I hereby move that the 2020, you know what, uh, I need to stop. Uh, do we have any of the chancellors here, legal advisors? Solomon Kano, are you here? Okay, Sakano, uh, please unmute him. Um, I, need the, I need, this is a legal part of our work, so I shouldn't do it here. All right, can you let him in? Sorry? Sakana, we need you to move a resolution and let us approve it. And then we declare the synod over before I pray. Okay, all right. Uh, let me see who else uh, is on this call. Uh, the chancellor is not there. You know what, I, I'll do it. Uh, it is my pleasure to move that we adjourn the Synod of the Anglican Diocese of the West 2020, which is our eighth Synod. All in favor, uh, please raise your hands. Anyone opposed? Who wants to stay longer? The bishop will go home and you can stay. <laughs> All right, so uh, the uh, synod is hereby adjoined. Thank you once again, and let us pray. The Lord be with you. We pray for our nation. Heavenly Father, you sent your son among us to proclaim the kingdom of God in cities, towns, villages, and lonely places. Behold and visit, we pray, the communities of our nation. Renew the bonds of charity that uphold our civic life. Send us honest and able leaders. Deliver us from poverty, prejudice, and oppression. That peace may prevail with righteousness and justice with mercy. And at the last, bring us to your holy city, the new Jerusalem, where we shall know perfect unity and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God, for as much as without thee we are not able to please thee, mercifully grant that thy Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee and the same Spirit liveth and reigneth, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all and 